And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Well, my message this morning is entitled, Building on the Rock. Last time we were together, I told you that the scripture was written in, oftentimes in figurative language, and there's many metaphors, like the, you know, the sheep and the goats and the wolf and the fig trees and the vineyards and all of that. And one of the most enduring metaphors in scripture is actually the rock. It was King David who said this in Psalm 118, verse 2. He said, my God is the rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. And all the way through scripture, we see this reference to the rock. If you ever go to Israel, anybody been to the Holy Land? You begin to realize why they use that metaphor. Everything in Israel is made out of rock. Rock is everywhere. I feel sorry for Joseph. He was a carpenter. I didn't see anything while I was there made out of wood. So I don't know how the guy was making a living. And I want you to think about, about Jesus. He was born into this world, and they put him in a manger, and everybody imagines this little wooden crib, right? Little wooden feeding trough. Even the mangers were made out of rock. If you go, that's one of the first things you see when you go to Israel. Kind of interesting. So Jesus was born in a rock. Then he lived his whole life walking on the rock. And then when he died, they put him in a tomb made out of made out of rock. So his life was all about rock. And so it helps us understand why he talked so much about this metaphor of the rock. And what we're going to be doing today is talking about building our life upon the rock, because that was one of the key parables that Jesus gave us, is that we should be those who build our house upon the rock. And so if you have your Bible with you, we're going to start right away into Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at this parable. Most of you know it, but we're going to take it apart maybe a little bit different than you have in the past. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will I liken to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall. Jesus says there's only two kinds of people. Those who hear the word and do it, and those who hear the word and don't do it. And he says, these two people I liken to either a wise man or a fool. And he said, you know, here's what's interesting about this. When you build a house, whether you built it on the rock or the sand, if it's the same builder, it's going to look the same, right? It's going to look the same. You're not going to know what kind of house it is until the storm comes. And he, did he say if the storm comes? Is that what he said? He didn't, say, he didn't say if, he said, and the storm came, and the winds came, and the rains came, and the wind blew, and he says, the house on the, on the sand, its fall was great, but only the house on the rock was that which stood. And he says, those who, who, who hear the word and do it, they're the ones who built their house on the rock, and those who hear the word and don't do it, their house is built on the shifting sands of our world, and it is going to fall when, not if, the storms come. I mean, if you go to Israel, you will see houses that are not hundreds of years old. You'll see buildings that are actually thousands of years old because they've been built upon the rock, and there they are, they're still standing. After all of these centuries, still standing because they were founded and built upon the rock. And this is what Jesus tells us, how we need to build our life, how we need to build our, our house. And you know, if you look around this room, there are people in this room who've built their house on the rock and built the house on the sand. And from the outside, you can't tell the difference. The house just all looks the same. Because in this room, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but there are doers of the word, and there are hearers only. And we have to decide what we're going to do. Are we going to build our house on the rock? Are we going to build it so that when, not if, the storms come, we will stand? Let me show you a picture uh, of something in a moment uh, that happened, that illustrated this so profoundly in my life that I want to share it with you. 2004, I was in a concert, or a conference, rather, in Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola is in the panhandle up in the north part of Florida. It's right on the north side of the, of the Gulf of Mexico. And at this conference, we had an afternoon off, and we decided to go over to Santa Rosa Island. It's just across the causeway, and it's sort of a vacation island. And here's the picture of it right here. Anybody been to Santa Rosa Island? I want you to look at this picture really carefully of this island. Do you see any trees on it? Do you see anything that's going to hold that island together? That island, I, I don't know, they call it an island. I have another name for this. I call it a sandbar. 
Uh, and there's beautiful luxury hotels. There are multi-million dollar homes that are built on this island. You beachfront property, these beautiful, uh, expensive homes on the front, right on the beach. And you know people love that sort of thing and the great view and right on the Gulf of Mexico. So when we were there in 2004, we got there just after Hurricane Ivan. Hurricane Ivan was a category three storm uh, with winds of 120 uh, miles per hour. And what happened is it moved, look at this picture here, it moved the entire island north about 100 yards. The entire island moved. You see these houses that were once on the beach are now almost right in the water. In fact, in the next picture, some of them were in the water like this. And it's just unbelievable. Some of them were completely trashed, completely uh, d disappeared entirely. Others were damaged and could be repaired. But the most bizarre part of it was the fact that the whole beach, the whole island had moved. Why? Because the island was made out of sand. You look at this next picture here. This guy parked his car in a no parking zone. <laughs> That's the road on top of him. You're supposed to talk, park on top of the road, not under the road. And uh, I was, we didn't even know when we were in Pensacola that there had been any signs of the hurricane. But when we got out to Santa Rosa Island, we saw the incredible damage that this storm had done because all of these houses and all these buildings, they were built on what? They're built on the sand. And when the storms come, and when the rain beats, and when the wind blows, the fall of these houses is going to be great. So, so we're moving, making our way down the island. I can't believe the damage of this place. And I come across, I see a man, and his house is still standing. It's on those, those pillars, those piers. And uh, he's working on his house, and he's fixing it. And the house beside it was completely gone. All it was was these poles sticking out of the water with a for sale sign on one of the poles in the water. So I facetiously said to the man, I said, hey, how much for this one? And the man said, that one's $400,000. I said, really? He says, yeah, but you have to haul your own sand. I said, what do you mean you have to haul your own sand? He says, the sand's on the other side of the island. He says, you have to hire a truck and movers, and they'll bring the sand. It'll cost you ten dollars or $12,000, and you can move your beach back, and you're good to go. $400,000, and I don't even get any property, just water. And I'm sort of chuckling at this and trying not to be too mean because this man was building his house. And I said, so, so what are you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to rebuild my house. And I said, really? After all of this, he says, yeah, I've been here 17 years. I've lost my house four times. <laughs> four times. And I said, well, why don't you, like, move? And he says, because this is my home, and I'm staying put, and this is where I live, and I'm rebuilding this house. Ten months later, that same island was hit by Hurricane Dennis, Category 3, 120 mile an hour winds, and destroyed the whole island again. And I'm thinking to myself, how many times are you going to build your house in the sand? How many times are you going to allow your house to be destroyed, storm after storm after storm? When I, I'm not trying to be mean, but it sort of seems like these people have more money than brains. What do you think? <laughs> you, they just continually build their house in the sand. You know, I was sort of amused by... Uh, something Al Gore did. You remember Al Gore he made his movie, the, An Inconvenient Truth. And one of the things he said that was going to happen was that global warming was going to melt the polar ice caps, and the whole sea level was going to rise, and as a consequence, uh, you know, all of the coastal areas were all going to be flooded. And so he makes his movie, he wins an Oscar, he uh, wins a Nobel Peace Prize for it, he makes all kinds of millions of dollars, and then he takes his money and buys a $9 million mansion, catch this, on the California beach. And I'm thinking, why would he do that? I bought this $9 million ocean view villa so I could keep a better lookout on rising sea levels. And you can't help but miss the irony in all this. And I'm not trying to criticize the man. But when we look at what people do, is they build their house on the sand, and then they wonder why the thing collapses. By contrast, let me show you this house in Rhode Island. It's Narragansett Bay on, in Rhode Island. It's right in the Atlantic Ocean. This house is 109 years old. It has survived hurricane after hurricane, storm after storm, wind after wind, and it's standing because it's built on the rock, and it's made the foundation out of rock, and when the winds come, which they do, and the hurricanes come, which they do, and when the rain comes, as they do, this house for 109 years has endured because its foundation was built on the rock. It doesn't matter what the house looks like on the outside. It's what's underneath the house that matters, right? That's why I brought you this picture. <laughs> Not quite sure what that guy was thinking, but it's gorgeous. <laughs> it, all I know is it's not going anywhere. There it is. And so when we look at this concept of building our house in the rock, Jesus says the people who build their house in the rock are the people who hear the word and do it. And the people who 
build their house in the sand. They're the people who do the word, hear the word and do not do it. And he says, that house is coming down because the storms are going to come. The wind is going to come. The rain is going to come. And so this morning, I could go and I could tell you that you need to do the word. And I could say, you need to do this and do this and do this. And I could give you a big, long list of do's. And then you would say, I don't know if I can do all that. But instead of telling you what to do, I'm going to tell you the process as to how you establish building your house on the rock. And there's a very clear scripture on this. And it's in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And it's one you all know. And if you look at it carefully, it actually tells us how we get to the place where we establish our house on the rock so that it stands. Now, if you've found it, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, this is what it says. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate, say meditate, in it day and night, that you may observe to do. Say observe to do. According to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. How many of you like the last part of that promise? <laughs> then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This is a refrigerator verse, isn't it? This is a bumper sticker verse for sure. Everybody wants to have prosperity. Everybody wants to have good success. And so what, what God was doing with Joshua was he was taking him and his entire nation after the death of Moses into the promised land. He was not only asking Joshua to establish his house on the rock, he was telling him to establish a whole nation on the rock. And he says, this is what I want you to do. I need you to go in and I need you to reestablish a nation. I need you to transform a country. I need you to build a judicial system, a morality system, an education system, an agriculture system. I need you to go and transform an entire culture, Joshua. That's what I need you to do. And I'm going to give you success and I'm going to give you prosperity. But here's the key. And he says, what I want you to do is this book of the law, those five books of Moses, which was the Bible in those days. I want you to meditate in them day and night. And that's where we're going to start. I'm going to give you three words that we're going to see in this passage as to how to establish ourselves to the place where we become doers of the word. The first one is meditate. The second one is communicate. And the third one is demonstrate. Meditate. Let's talk about that for a moment. Because he says, I want you to meditate in this word, this book of the law. I want you to meditate in it day and night. Now, as Christians, we hardly think about meditation. We always think of that as something of Eastern mysticism and something that, you know, Shirley MacLaine does. And we don't think of it as something that Christians do. But those of you that have been in the 40 Days in the Word groups in these last six weeks have been learning how to meditate in the Word of God. 29 times the Bible tells us to meditate on his word. And meditating on, on his word is key to us becoming the word of God. For the word to begin to dwell in us, you need to begin to meditate on it. And some of you who've been in this study with us know that the word meditate, properly translated, is actually the word ruminate. And ruminate is something, what does? Cows. Yeah, the cows, they ruminate. You know how, the, you know how cows do it? They, they eat their food and then they regurgitate. Have you been noticing all the rhymes in this? Meditate. Ruminate, now regurgitate. I know that you appreciate that I articulate in a way that does not complicate. <laughs> and, and I do that so that you can formulate how to navigate your way to regenerate your soul. And so I'm just trying to help you here. <laughs> yeah, I'm a regular Dr. Seuss, I get it. <laughs> and, but it's sort of funny, these words, you know, that, that we all know that the cow, what he does is he regurgitate, the ruminant animals, they will ruminate or they will regurgitate their food and they'll eat it again. Now we, you know, let's just get real, you know, biologically, we don't like doing that, right? I mean, you know, even, you don't even like, you know, have you ever been talking along and all of a sudden you had one of those little, you, you know, you threw up in the back of your throat, did any of that ever happened to you? It's, it's so gross, I mean, the taste is so gross. And you can probably remember every time you've ever thrown up in your life, right? The cow does it several times a day. He's regurgitating. He's throwing up every day. That's what he does. He throws up. He eats it. Swallows it again. You, you throw up, and you're all grossed out by it, you know? We can remember every time we've ever done it. I, I remember one, one time when we were younger, my parents were driving us out to Thunder Bay. And my sister got car sick, and she had to throw up. And she said, pull over, pull over, pull over. Finally, my dad pulled over, and she threw up all over the place, right? And when you see somebody else throw up, what do you do? Yeah, you threw up. Yeah, so we're all thrown up. So we're, we're all thrown up. The doors are open. We're all thrown up. 
And anyway, so we were actually were at a truck stop in, in Ontario, just past Dryden, and the name of that little town is called, you're gonna love this, it's called Burrup's Corner. <laughs> we stopped for a little barf at Burrup's Corner. We're burrup, burrup. And so whenever I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just sort of entertaining myself at this point. You know, if you go the other way through Saskatchewan, if you ever need to relieve yourself, you can stop at Peapot, Peapot, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Uh, Keith told me it's not pronounced like that. He says it's Piopo, but it looks like Peapot to me, which is like an hour past urine, Saskatchewan. And, you know, talk about the power of suggestion, you know? All this stuff going on, Brup's Corner this way, Peapot that way, you know? All kinds of stuff going on on the highway. <laughs> I do apologize. For that. No, I don't. I'm, I'm, in, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to illustrate the point of meditating which is actually regurgitating, which kind of grosses us out. But in fact, we do use the expression. We say, you know, somebody tells you something, you say, let me chew on it for a day. Now, we're not going to actually regurgitate it, but what we're going to do is we're going to mull on it. We're going to think about it over and over and over again. And, and God said to Joshua, he said, this book of the law, the word, my word, this is what I want you to do. I want you, if you want to be successful, if you want to be prosperous, I want you to meditate in it day and night. And I know people say, but Pastor Mark, I can't meditate in the Word day and night. I got uh, bills to worry about, and a job to worry about, and kids to worry about. Oh, really? Does anyone know what worry is? It's negative meditation. It's just the same thing. Worry is just meditating in the negative sense, right? You're just, when you think about, I want you to think about this. We actually think from the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed, we are meditating. Our brain is constantly at work. And then we go to sleep and we dream about it whatever it was, your brain never ceases. You actually already meditate day and night. The big question is, what are you gonna meditate about? Everybody sitting here, all of you are thinking about something right now. You know what they tell public speakers like me? They say we have to be very aware of the fact that at any given time, 75% of the people aren't even listening because they're thinking of something else, right? That means only 25% of you even heard what I just said. <laughs> now the other 75 are wondering what you're laughing about. You know, it's just, it's just sort of the way it works. We, we, have to, we have to, our brain is always at work. We're always meditating. We're always thinking. And we have to decide what are we going to think about. And so we can, we can think about worry. We can think about these things, which we will day and night. Or we can decide that we're going to start to think about positive things. Let me show you something from the scripture. It's uh, Philippians chapter 4. I'll throw it up on the screen here. Listen to what it says. It says, finally, brethren... Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The scripture tells you that the things that are pure and just and holy, the things that are of good report, these are the things you need to meditate on. See, the word is full of these things. But see, what happens is our, we allow our brains to get co so caught up in negativity. And people, and I'm, again, not trying to be judgmental here, but when I find people that have panic attacks and anxiety and depression, you know what? Generally, those people are thinking about the problem, and they're worrying, and they're meditating on those negative things all day long. And what happens is, as a man thinks in his heart, finish it for me, so is he, the scripture says. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the things we think about are the things we become. So if you're depressed, what you do is you tend to think about how depressed you are. And when you're worried, you begin to think about how anxious you are. And what happens is it, it actually it perpetuates itself, and it's like a snowball, and it just goes and becomes more and more and more negative. You know, even a battery has a positive side, right? <laughs> but some of us are so, so negative, we put us in a dark room, we develop, right? And the scripture tells it is, is if, we would, if we would begin to meditate on the things that are praiseworthy, the things that are just, the things that are lovely, then the very verse before that, verse 7, throw it up on the screen, says this, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You see, it's the things that we meditate, the things that we think about, are the things that we become. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And all worry is, and all anxiety is, is meditating on the problem instead of on the answer. It was like this story of this man, he was in the hospital and he was fleeing down the hall in his hospital gown and orderly stopped him and said, what's going on, sir? And he says, I'm, I'm running because I just heard the nurse say, don't worry, sir, it's a simple operation, there's nothing to worry about. 
He says, well, sir, he was just trying to put you at peace. She says, he says, sure, but she was talking to the doctor, not to me. Right? You get it. So the first thing, okay, so it wasn't funny. Why do I care? <laughs> so the first thing is this. The first thing is, is meditate. Meditate in the word day and night. The second thing is communicate. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Or in other words, he says, I don't want you saying anything else. He says, what I need you to say, Joshua, is I need, you to, I need you not only to think and meditate day and night in my word and my law, but I need you to begin to communicate it. I need you to begin to say it. Because what happens is this. God watches over his word to perform it. And as we begin to speak the things that God has put in, in, in our heart, you see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you first begin to meditate, eventually those things are going to come out. But you see, what you think about and the things you're exposed to are the things that are going to actually come out of your mouth. You know, one of the things that really distresses me is what's happening with, with pop culture. I don't know if you've noticed this, but our, our culture is becoming more and more vulgar in our language. And the, the, the amount of vulgarity and foul language that comes out of people's mouths, and I think a lot of it has to do with pop culture. You look at the music videos, for example, they're, they're downright obscene. You look at the movies, if you rent a movie, uh, Kathy and I, we'll, we'll be five minutes into a movie and we'll turn it off. Because you know what? I'm not going to allow that stuff, that language, to bombard me and to fill my heart and to fill my mind. I don't want to hear it. And you can barely watch. So some of you are with me on this. And you can barely watch television anymore because the same kind of language is on television and the storyline. Have you noticed that there's no heroes left anymore? Do you know there's no good people in the TV shows anymore? Every, there's two kinds of people on, in the television shows now. There's bad people and worse people. And the criminals have now become the protagonists. And I think ever since The Sopranos, and it's not something I ever watched, but they made the, the, the crime bosses the heroes of the program. And so that's the model. And so what happens is, is we're there, whether we're watching TV or the internet or music videos, we are being bombarded by this negativity. And the problem is garbage in what? Garbage out. And let me be bold about something here. Because people say, they'll say something. They'll say, oh, I'm sorry, that just slipped out. And I'll say, no, it didn't. It didn't sl just slip out. Foul people say foul things. And what happens is we've allowed our hearts to become polluted. We've allowed our, 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 the vulgarity to get into us. And as a consequence, it's coming out of our mouths. And I look around, I see church people saying things that would make a sailor blush. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is garbage in and garbage out. You know, I, when I grew up, my father was you know, a very educated man. He was a lawyer. And he, he used to always say this. He would say, people that use vulgarity are just showing their lack of vocabulary, is what he used to say. And he used to tell us that from a young age. And so consequently, even before I was a Christian, I wasn't one who was given to swearing, because I always remembered that people who use vulgarity are showing their lack of vocabulary. And it's not like in the English language, we don't have words to express ourselves. My goodness, it is such an exquisite language. There are a dozen words to say anything that you could ever imagine. You can communicate, elucidate, you can articulate, you can delineate, you can enumerate, you can educate. And those are all just rhyming ones, right? They're just one word after another in the English language, and yet we resort to four-letter words. And consequently, we forget the power of the word of God in our mouth. And he says, let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth. Why does the scripture say that? Because words have power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's why he's telling Joshua, he's saying, you need to have nothing else coming out of your mouth but the word of God. And when you're faced with a battle, when you're faced with struggles, what you need to do is communicate the word of God. And what will happen is I will watch over my word to perform it. And I think we have forgotten the power of the word. I honestly do. Let me give you an illustration about this. Any of you ever read Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time? It goes back a long way now. Here's the cover of it. It was one of his first books, or his first best-selling book. It's sort, of, it's sort of astrophysics for dummies, is what it is. He really dumbed it down. It was a very accessible book, from, black, from the Big Bang to black holes. And I remember reading this book probably back in 88 or 89 when it came out, and there was a quote that he talked about the Big Bang, when he talked about the universe coming into being. And I've never forgotten the quote. And this is what he said. He says, a tiny microscopic dot of consecrated matter and energy floating in the void of nothingness 
spontaneously exploded, spawning the planets and the stars and the galaxies of our universe today. That's how he describes the universe coming into existence. A tiny, microscopic dot of concentrated matter and energy that just spontaneously exploded, spawning the stars and planets and the galaxies of our universe today. The universe, 13.6 billion miles across. 13.6 billion years it would take you if you could travel at the speed of light to get from one side to the other. Hundreds of millions of stars and hundreds of millions of galaxies filling this universe. And Stephen Hawking tells us that it was a tiny microscopic dot of concentrated matter and energy floating in the void of nothingness. And it spontaneously exploded. And the universe came into being. Am I selling you on this? Are you buying into this? You know what? I'm actually trying to. Because I think I know what that moment was. Because the Bible actually describes it. Hebrews chapter 11 says, By faith we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We know what that tiny microscopic dot of concentrated matter and energy was. We know what happened. You go read the book of Genesis. There it is. It says, and God created the heavens and the earth, and there was darkness over the face of the earth. And the Spirit moved over the surface of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And all the way through the book of Genesis, we say, and God said, and it was, and God said, and it was, and God said, and it was, and God said, and it was. And the universe that we see today was a result of God, through the majesty of his word, declaring and speaking it, and out of his mouth it proceeded, and boom, the universe came into being 13.6 billion light years all across. That's how it came into being. I just think Stephen Hawking is not describing the tiny microscopic dot correctly. That's all. It was the word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I want you to appreciate how much power there is in the word. You see, he believed, therefore he spoke. They, we believe, therefore we speak. And, you know, we think that we can just sort of callously and capriciously just say things and have words come out of our mouth with no consequences. But the problem is words have power. And faith is a matter of the words in which we speak. Do you remember the, the, the man whose son was an epileptic and he went to the disciples and the disciples could not heal him and then he went to Jesus and said, I brought my son to your disciples and they could not heal him. And then Jesus said, all things are possible to them that believe. And the man immediately said, I believe. And then what did he say? Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Let me ask you a question. Did that man believe or not believe? I think he was struggling to believe, don't you? I think at first he said, I believe, and then he went, thought about it and thought, I don't really believe. Help, help my unbelief, help my unbelief. And what one really believes, what one's in one's heart, what one meditates on, that's what's ultimately going to come out, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So let me give you two stories from the book of Luke that talk about the Word of God and about faith. And they both have to do with the angel Gabriel and a visitation. The angel Gabriel visits a, a young virgin named Mary. And tells Mary this, that you are going to bear a child, you're going to conceive a child, and you're going to bear the child, and his name will be Emmanuel. And he, he explains how he's going to be the savior of the world. Mary says this, how can this be, since I know not a man? And then the angel said, all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. That's actually a mistranslation. Did you know that? If you were to go read it in the original Greek, you know what it says? It says, no word of God is void of power. That's the literal translation. How can this be, since I know not a man? And, and the angel says, there is no word of God void of power. And Mary says, let it be done unto me according to your word. Out of her mouth, it came, let it be done unto me according to your word. Boom, she was pregnant. Nine months later, she gave birth to Jesus. Now, in the same chapter, six months earlier than this, the angel Gabriel visited Zacharias. Zacharias was married to Elizabeth. And they were advanced in age. And so the angel appears to and they were barren. And the angel appears to Zacharias, and he says, this is what's going to happen. Your wife is going to get conceive, and she's going to have a child, and he's going to be a forerunner, and his name will, shall be John. And do you remember what Zacharias said to the angel? He said, how can this be, since we are well advanced in age? Now, does that seem significantly different than the question that Mary asked? How can this be, since I know not a man? 
I don't think there's a big difference. But they both ask the question, how? How can this be? How can this be? But what was the difference between Mary's response and, and Zacharias' response? I'll tell you what. Mary believed it, and Zacharias didn't. And we know that from the context that he did not believe it, he did not receive it, he did not accept it. And so when it became apparent that Zacharias did not believe it, what did the angel do? The angel said, you shall be mute for nine months. You're not going to open your mouth. Zip, zip it. Listen, Zach, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> I'm shutting you up, buddy. I'm shutting you down. Her, his wife conceives almost immediately. For nine months, the man is completely mute. Why? Why did God make him mute? Because look, if you're not going to cooperate, if the words of your mouth are not going to cooperate with my plan, there's only one way to deal with you, and that's just shut you up. So just shut up, and we can solve this problem. Because God's going to do it with or without you. And so nine months, the guy's mute. So then finally, the baby is born, and they're all excited. And there's Zach. He hasn't said anything for nine months. And they came to him, and they said, well, I guess you're going to call him Zacharias. Hand me my iPad. Let me tell you. And he writes out, his name shall be John. And what happened next? Immediately, his voice was loosed. You see, finally, he got in line with the word of God. Finally, he got in line with God's plan. And you see, that's what God was saying to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You've got to get in line with my plan, Joshua. And if you will speak the things that you've meditated in your heart, you're going to see great success and prosperity. I want you to think about Jesus for a minute. The Mount of Temptation, he was tempted three times. And three times he pushed back the devil. Three times he defeated Satan. How many remember what he used? How did he do it? He used the word of God. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, for man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He shut the devil down three times because out of his mouth came the word of God. And the word of God has power because God watches over his word to perform it. That's how this works. And see, this is, shouldn't be a big stretch for us, how important the words of our mouth are. Everything that you have and everything you've done in your life has been a result of the words that you've spoken. Think about it. The job you have right now, how did you get that job? You probably went to a job interview. They probably asked you some questions, and you gave them the right answers, right? The right things came out of your mouth, and consequently, they hired you because the words came out of your mouth. Men, those of you who are sitting here with your wives, how did you get that pretty girl that's sitting beside you? I know it's a miracle. How did you do it? <laughs> I'll tell you how you did it. I mean, first of all, let's remember this. You could meditate on how much you love her till the cows come home. That wasn't going to get you married, right? And then one day, in a moment of weakness, you got down on your knee, and you said, I love you. It came out of your mouth. I love you. Will you marry me? And in a moment of temporary insanity, she said, I, I will. Right? And that's how it happened. It came out of the, to it was what was in your heart came out of your mouth. And as a result, it became what you are and what you do. Right? It's, it's like the story of this, this elderly couple. They're living in a nursing home. They had been going out for three or four years together. Finally, the man decides that he's going to ask this girl, this woman, both widowed at this point, to marry him. So she, he asks her to marry him. And then the next morning, he wakes up in his bed. And he remembers asking her. But for the life of him, he can't remember what the answer was. And he thought, this is embarrassing. I can't think what she, whether she said yes or no. So then he phones her up and he says, you know, I'm really embarrassed about this. He said, I asked you to marry me last night, and I can't remember if your answer was yes or no. She says, I'm so glad you called. I remember saying yes to somebody. I just don't remember who it was. <laughs> so the first thing is this. It's meditate. The second thing is communicate. And the third thing is demonstrate. See, what did the scripture say? It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it in it day and night that you may observe to do. Did you catch that? See, this is why I didn't just start with b being the hearer of the word and the doer of the word. I didn't say, do this, do this, do this, do this, because it's a process. And what we do is when we begin to meditate on God's word, then God's word becomes real to us, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when we begin to speak it, what happens is we will begin to observe to do that which we believe and that which we spoke. You see, your thoughts produce your words, your words produce your actions, and your actions produce your destiny. And you see, that's how it works. 
If you want to be a doer of the word, it's not a matter of keeping a bunch of rules and regulations. It's a matter of beginning to learn how to meditate in God's word, begin to be one who speaks it and declares it in the midst of obstacles, and then what happens is you will find yourself actually beginning to perform it, or as I'm calling it, demonstrating it. You see, Joshua was promised prosperity and good success. Did that mean he never had a, never had a failure? Did that mean he never lost a battle? He lost the second battle, the very second battle. He lost it, but did he win the war? Yeah, he won the war because he kept determined, he kept focused, and he was one who meditated, spoke, and demonstrated the Word of God. Let me close with one final story this morning, and it's the story of the, the movie Chariots of Fire. How many of you have seen that movie? A long time ago, 1981. Won, uh, won Best Picture in 1981 in the Oscars, and it's the story of Eric Lytle. And Eric Lytle was a sprinter in the 1924 Paris Olympics. He was called the Flying, the Flying Scotsman. He was the world favorite. He was going to win the gold medal. That was sort of a foregone conclusion, but there was one little small problem. And the problem was this, that the race was being run on a Sunday. And because of his faith and his belief of the Sabbath day, and you may not share his, his understanding of this, but his understanding was this, is that he should not run the race on the Sabbath day, and he refused to run his 100-meter race in the Olympics, even though it was going to cost him the gold medal. He, he believed it. He spoke it. He did it. He had everybody mad at him. His coaches were mad at him. His teammates were mad at him. His whole nation was mad at him. And it looked like he was going to be a failure because he was taking a stand and, and doing what he believed was right. Then what happened was a teammate gave up his place, his start place in the 400 meter, which was not on the Sunday. And so he took that start. Just before the race, an American masseuse came and handed him a scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 2. And the scripture said, if you will honor me, I will honor you. He held that in his hand, in his fist, the entire race. And in the starting blocks, that scripture, if you will honor me, I will honor you, was in his fist. He took off out of the starting blocks, and not only did he win the gold medal in the 400 in the 1924 Paris Olympics, but he set a world record. You see, if you will honor me, I will honor you. That's how this whole works, people. If we will begin to meditate on God's word out of the abundance of the heart, we will begin to communicate that. And if we begin to communicate it, we will begin to observe, observe to do. How do you become a doer of the word? How do you build your house in the rock? You start, for, start first by meditating, then communicating, and then demonstrating, and then you shall build your house on the rock, and the winds and the waves will come, and your house will stand because it is built and founded on the rock, and then you will make your way pro prosperous, and you will find good success. Let's stand together, shall we? I want to ask you to do me a favor this morning. I'm wondering if you could all bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. This will only take a few moments here. Because I know in a room this size, there are people that have never invited Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. And you're not sure that if you were to die tonight, you'd even go to heaven. And this journey of beginning and establishing and founding our house and our life upon the rock, the scripture says Christ is that rock. And if you're here today and you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you've done it in the past and you've slipped away and you need to come back. I want to give you an opportunity to establish yourself on Jesus Christ, the rock, your fortress, your deliverer. I'm going to make it very simple. I won't call you for it, single you out. I will not ask you to come forward or say anything publicly. But right where you are, with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you would like to make that decision today to be a follower of Christ, I just want you to slip up your hand. Just slip it up right where you are. I'm not going to call you forward. Just take a moment. Thank you in the middle. Anybody else want to join these folks? Thank you in the far side. Thank you in the back. Anybody else? Just take a moment. Raise your hand. Let me see it. Once I've seen it, you can put it down. Anybody else? Thank you on the side. All right. Great. All right. You can all put your hands down. I didn't see all your hands, but... It doesn't matter. God did, and that's what matters. And so, because I said I wouldn't single anybody out, let's all say this together, can we? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross, that you died for my sins, rose again on the third day, forever lived to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Lord, help me to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Help me to build my house on the rock. Help me to meditate in your word day and night. 
Help me to communicate your word, to speak those things that will build and establish a foundation in my life that I may be able to observe to do and walk in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a hand, shall we?